Thanks, George. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I want to thank George and everybody else for uh, putting on this event again. How many years have you been doing this? This is the second time. This is the second time. Well, last year I heard very good things about it from a number of people. I think this is a very uh, important event because um, it highlights and enhances what I think and many people think is really a particular strength of Cornell, and that's uh, the uh, our shared facilities, shared core facilities, as they're called in, in this area. Um, we are certainly not the richest university. I have been reminded of that regularly uh, over the last year. But uh, we make particularly good use of our resources in the area of research support, in my opinion. Uh, that's been a long history at Cornell, you know, particularly in uh, starting in the material science area back in the 80s, uh, in the area of high performance computing, in submicron fabrication, nanofabrication, and over the last decade, particularly, uh, while there have been cores in the life sciences for a long time, over the last decade there's really been a remarkable growth in the capabilities here. I mean, the, the numbers of the scope of users that are now being done in the, in the uh, facilities that George and uh, your, the others of you here are, are uh, uh, operating and managing for the use of the Cornell cam Ithaca campus, the WOW campus, and everywhere is very, very impressive. You're up to about you know thousands of users a year and unique users you have a uh, uh, user fee income which is a very good indication of value in my opinion of like five million dollars a year that's very impressive compared to where it was ten years ago of course that's driven by um, uh, many things It's driven by the science It's driven by the change in the technology my view as an outsider is that life sciences uh, used to be a, a collection of very narrow disciplines with not a whole lot of communication between them. At least from the outside, that's what it seemed. I think now with the genomics and proteomics revolution, with the technologies that have come, uh, there are a lot more unification and a lot more need to share, a lot more need to get access to equipment that a single investigator can't possibly have. A lot more need to manipulate and mine the data that comes out of these uh, tools, and that means you need to work together. The university needs to support that, and so uh, we've done, I think, as well as any university that I'm aware of across the board, not just in life sciences, but in the physical sciences, computational sciences, and we're going to continue to do that. It's a comparative advantage we have, and we're going to keep pursuing it as much as we can. Um, of course, that means you have to deliver a good product right, the, the core directors, and you have to make sure that you have uh, uh, the, the user base to support what you want to do, what they want to do. We need to have local control and local insight uh, in order to evolve these facilities. But I think all that's in place, and I uh, really commend you for this type of activity of uh, getting the, uh, the discussion I heard just a few minutes ago of getting the word out to the user base, potential user base, building collaborations, building activities. So, so I'm very pleased with this sort of thing. The provost certainly is very supportive of shared facility concepts, and uh, we encourage you to keep on and keep going and keeping Cornell in the leadership. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussions today. Thanks, Bob. Um, so, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to just give a very brief overview of um, uh, the core structures um, on the Ithaca campus, uh, mainly focusing on what I know best, which is um, uh, the center that I'm associated with, the um, uh, Cornell University Life Sciences Core Laboratory Center. Uh, so I'm director of operations uh, for, uh, for the center and also uh, director of uh, advanced technology assessment. So uh, we're currently composed of uh, nine core facilities. We're open to all Cornell University uh, uh, investigators and also to outside investigators. Um, we're administered by the Biotech Institute. Our mission is to promote research in the life sciences with advanced technologies in a shared resource environment. Uh, and we have uh, fee-for-service uh, research. Uh, we do um, uh, high-level consultation. We do collaborative type of projects. Um, we do also technology testing and development, and we have the educational components. So these are the, um, uh, the, the technology cores uh, of the center. So we have DNA sequencing and a genotyping facility. Uh, in the audience, we have the director, Peter Schweitzer. 
Um, so um, uh, here we're doing high throughput conventional sequencing uh, uh, in the range of a million samples a year. Um, uh, we're uh, uh, about 30%, 20 to 30% of what we're doing is actually for the medical school. They ship uh, samples to us overnight. We typically return data to them in less than 24 hours. Um, uh, and uh, I should say the mandate of the center is to be of university-wide value. So, uh, so, you know, to provide value to all the Ithaca campus and to all the campuses of, of Cornell. Um, is, but in addition to Cornell, uh, uh, we provide uh, services to about 100 other institutions. Uh, both commercial and academic institutions, though about 80% of what we do are for uh, Cornell-affiliated investigators. So in, to, in addition to the conventional sequencing, we have uh, next-generation sequencing platforms, the Roche 454, we have three Illumina GAX2 uh, platforms. So these are basically the, the newer sequencing platforms that can give you an orders of magnitude more sequence. Uh, conventional sequencing, you can get like 100,000 bases per run. The newer sequence, uh, sequencing instruments, you can get uh, easily within the 10 billion uh, uh, base range in a single run. So you can just get a huge amount more information. Um, uh, and uh, there are a number of genotyping platforms as well uh, in the facility, um, uh, including uh, array-based platforms, um, the sequinome mass array uh, platform, uh, and um, RT RT-PCR type of platforms as well. So we have a microarray facility. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned we have um, uh, uh, various array platforms. It, it includes the uh, Illumina uh, microarray platform. We do a lot with the Affimatrix platform. We do NimbleGen. Um, we uh, uh, do uh, Agilent array processing. And we have a, the old-fashioned Pat Brown type of uh, do-it-yourself spotted array type of capabilities as well. So uh, this facility is doing a lot of uh, gene expression, a lot of SNP genotyping uh, 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 as well, and uh, they're uh, moving into supporting a lot of the RNA sample preparation for the RNA applications on the next generation sequencing platforms. And they're also using array-based platforms for uh, targeted sequence capture uh, for, that uh, uh, makes uh, next generation sequencing more cost effective. Um, we also have, um, in addition to the genomics and functional genomics types of uh, cores, we have a proteomics and mass spec facility. So there we have a number of different mass spec uh, uh, instruments. We have uh, ABI 4700, MALDI TOF TOF. We have uh, ABI, um, a number of electron spray instruments, including the ABI uh, 4000 QTRAP. We've got a water synap. We've got a, the latest version of the thermo orbitrap, the VLOS on order right now as well. So this core is doing um, protein identification, post-translational modification uh, 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 profiling, and small molecule characterization. Uh, we, uh, in the past year, we've established an epigenomics core. And this is the first um, uh, true cross-campus core that I know of um, uh, at Cornell. Um, so this is in collaboration with the medical school. Uh, we're doing a sample preparation on the medical school, uh, I should say at the medical school, um, uh, uh, basically restriction enzyme digest where we're separating out the methylated and non-methylated fractions of the genome. Um, we also have uh, uh, immunoprecipitation uh, services available down there as well. Uh, we're doing data generation uh, with a combination of instrumentation on the medical school and on the Ithaca campus, including uh, custom nimble gen arrays uh, for um, uh, chip chip and methylation based studies. Um, uh, we're using the sequinome mass array in our sequencing facility uh, for methylation validation studies. Um, and uh, we have the capability of using the next generation sequencing platforms to do whole genome methylation profiling. Um, so this cross-campus initiative collaboration has been uh, very productive. Uh, we also have a very high-end imaging core. It has everything from conventional confocal fluorescent microscopy. Uh, we uh, have whole animal fluorescent imaging capabilities, high-resolution ultrasound, and we're building our own multi-photon microscope. Uh, we also have a mouse transgenic facility that also provides cryopreservation services. 
Um, we have a high throughput screening technology, a uh, relatively new technology from Corning. It's called the Corning Epic. It's essentially a uh, souped up Biacore that uses uh, SBR technology to do, uh, use mass uh, differentiation to uh, do biochemical assays as well as cell cell interactions. We have the capability of doing thousands of samples per, per day for high throughput label free screening. Um, and to support all these cores, that can give you a real fire hose of data, we have a very high-end informatics core, the Computational Biology Service Unit, which we were just talking about in a prior discussion. Uh, so this has a, a very high uh, level of um, infrastructure. We have uh, almost a 1,400 um, uh, um, uh, CPU cluster. Uh, we've got a very close relationship with Microsoft. We're one of only 10 worldwide Microsoft-designated high-performance computing institutes. Uh, so we leverage a lot of grant funding from Microsoft to, for example, um, we've, uh, the group has built up a high-performance computing uh, portal for life sciences application. It's called uh, BioHPC. So essentially, uh, life scientists um, don't need to have expertise uh, for massively parallel um, computing uh, environments, but can take advantage of that computing power. Um, and uh, right now we have about 10,000 investigators in more than 80 countries using this application. It's free because of uh, the Microsoft uh, funding. And uh, we also allow just Cornell investigators to make even more intensive use of that application for a minimal fee-based structure because it's computationally intensive. Um, so, um, uh, and this is a group that builds the downstream uh, bioinformatic pipelines for our next generation sequencing as well as a number of other applications. Uh, and uh, it's, they're all PhD level um, uh, informaticians um, uh, and they provide everything from standard pipelines to consultation to collaborative type of services. Um, we also have a very high-end information technology services facility. It provides the laboratory information management systems for all these cores for samples submission, process tracking, and data return, um, and um, also uh, provides fee-for-services for similar types of both uh, computational um, uh, uh, computer support, um, uh, uh, limb support, and um, uh, other types of IT support for um, uh, the groups outside of our, uh, of our center. And finally, we have an advanced technology assessment effort, which is essentially a way of just saying, uh, to, uh, how do we figure out how to bring the new toys into Cornell? So um, uh, all, the, all the directors use their expertise in the field uh, to figure out what are the most promising emerging technologies, and we listen to what the uh, faculty say they need to be at the cutting edge of research. We try to identify the right platforms, try to identify funding to bring them in, um, and once they're in, we kick the tires to try to optimize the application on these new platforms. Um, and if they're appropriate for a high throughput production pipeline, we implement them into one of the existing core facilities, or uh, we look at funding mechanisms to establish a new core facility, and we also look at for uh, faculty support for that as well. I should say all these uh, cores have faculty advisory boards to make sure that we're um, uh, basically to give us feedback that we're providing the right type of value to the research efforts at Cornell. Um, so basically, we do everything from genes to proteins to phenotype, all tied together with bioIT and, um, and bioinformatics. We try to leverage that for support of uh, systems biology types of projects. We have collaborative programs in personalized medicine that uh, basically integrated uh, clinical phenotyping, SNP genotyping, gene expression, epigenomics, and proteomic studies of disease models. The first one we did was a collaborative program in uh, uh, pulmonary disease, uh, COPD, uh, between the, uh, all the three um, uh, uh, Cornell campuses. Uh, and this involved uh, a, a large number of the cores in our center. We have also have a collaborative program in prostate cancer that involves a number of institutions, as well as a collaborative program in neural tube defects. Um, and all of this came actually from the same type of structure that we use to support some uh, multi-institutional plant biology projects. We try to leverage the virtual multidisciplinary expertise that we have in our center for support of uh, instrumentation. For example, the next generation sequencing is really a team support by multiple cores that have expertise in various areas. Um, and um, 
I just want to point out that the center that I'm talking about, the, uh, the uh, Life Sciences Core Laboratory Center, is just one of many different core facilities at Cornell. Uh, at the, on the Ithaca campus, there are multiple other uh, core facilities. I just want to point out um, the uh, Nanobiotechnology Center, uh, the uh, Cornell, um, uh, uh, the CNF, the uh, Nanoscale Science and Technology Facility, um, uh, the CCMR, the uh, Cornell um, um, uh, uh, um, Center for Materials Research, uh, and uh, there's at least uh, half a dozen more cores that I won't mention, but uh, uh, we actually are uh, working with uh, Vivo uh, uh, at Cornell to make sure that everything is uh, appropriately represented so that folks can uh, search out information about the cores. Um, so at this point, I will um, uh, turn, it, uh, turn over the, the microphone uh, for uh, uh, a uh, brief survey of some of the resources in the CCMR, um, and then we'll go uh, and talk a bit about some of the resources on the medical campus as well as on the Cuttery campus. I've got another computer that I have to set up here, um, but I'll see if I can uh, do the talking at the same time. So, uh, my name is uh, Jurian Gerritsen, as I uh, um, said before, so I'm the uh, director of the Cornell Center for Materials Research uh, Shared Facilities. I'm also the associate director for the Cornell Center for Nanoscale Systems, uh, where we normally do not do any sort of life sciences or biology activities, but we did have one activity, I think, where we had to put a bagel into some kind of instrument where people wanted to measure the dielectric uh, permittivity. But normally people just come in there with uh, transistors and those kind of things. Um, so uh, from my vocabulary, you will probably understand that I'm not uh, trained as a um, biologist, although I did have some involvement in the uh, development of the EPIC instrument that is here at Cornell. In fact, that was uh, the first uh, experiments that were done uh, were basically carried out in, in my lab when I was in, uh, in France working uh, with uh, Corning. So I, I do know a little bit about the... Um, certainly about the background and the history of that part, and I was involved in the development of uh, uh, DNA uh, printing and those kind of things, uh, uh, high-density arrays, um, while at, um, at Corning. I don't know what's going to happen here. I just have to keep talking. Um, so the, and I have to have the, the, uh, the microphone as well. Things are coming up slowly here. <coughs> All right, that's where we are. Is that visible? Uh, you have to make a switch there, okay. Um, so this um, uh, shared facility is uh, basically uh, run by the Cornell Center for Materials Research, which is a NSF-funded uh, uh, research organization in the Materials Research Science and en Engineering uh, Department from the NSF. We also get some funding from uh, New York State. Um, the goal of our facilities are to enable the material science and engineering programs undertaken uh, uh, by the center and other Cornell researchers, uh, including those at Weil and Qatar and uh, Geneva. Uh, the way that we run is uh, uh, somewhat different, I think, from the Life Sciences Core uh, labs, is uh, that uh, we have a strong focus on just uh, training and educating uh, uh, the researchers, the students, and the postdocs that come in, and uh, they do the work, and we provide uh, the instrumentation and enable uh, the analysis and the processing equipment uh, that we have. So most of the work is uh, carried out uh, by the students themselves, uh, but uh, the key to success of our uh, facilities are uh, certainly uh, the uh, facility managers, uh, which uh, together have about uh, 180 uh, years of experience uh, in, in running these type of facilities, and uh, some of them you may have met uh, before. Um, all the information that I'm sharing uh, with you today, you don't have to write it down because we have a website, and, uh, and, and there's Vivo, of course, and uh, hopefully then uh, we can find the managers in there. Um, there's a, a total of about 150 instruments in those facilities, but it's uh, only about 20 that bring in about 80% of the uh, revenue. Uh, and I share you uh, the, those that I think are, are of most interest to th this particular audience, um, especially in the area of uh, electron and optical microscopy. We have a very strong 
uh, uh, representation. Uh, I, I'll uh, go into that in uh, somewhat more detail, but we also have a, a very extensive set of uh, spectroscopy and elect electronic measurement systems, and some of that may also be of interest uh, to life sciences, and I'll give you an example of uh, Raman microscopy uh, that we uh, uh, are now capable of doing. Uh, some of you may have an interest in, in uh, other surface analytical, analytical techniques uh, like XPS or scanning probe microscopy. Um, we also have near field scanning optical microscopy, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there is also a wide range of equipment uh, for soft matter analysis, and um, there's also some interest uh, uh, and some uh, usage uh, from not just the condensed matter uh, physicists uh, and the material scientists uh, on campus. Um, all, this, uh, all these instruments uh, and the information about uh, those can be found on our website, and I'll show you a little bit about more, uh, more about that later. Um, but in this graph, you can sort of uh, see where our strength lies. This is a general plot of um, technologies uh, plotted as a function of the uh, detection range. Uh, so how uh, accurate can you measure particular um, compounds, elements, or molecules, and the uh, spatial resolution. And on top of that, I'll plot um, where we are uh, represented uh, uh, in, in a competitive way. And uh, we have a very strong set of uh, imaging capabilities, TM, SEM, etc. And in this top range, uh, we have got uh, most of the instruments uh, ranging from X-ray to Raman, XPS. And we are very strong in electron energy loss spectroscopy on campus. Uh, we are basically uh, one of the top in the world. Electron energy loss spectroscopy is basically that you do transmission electron microscopy and you look at the energy of the electrons that go through your sample. They've lost some energy and it can tell you something about the elements that uh, the electrons have encountered while going through the specimen. And we can do that at atomic resolution. And we've got a um, basically top of the range uh, uh, equipment here uh, with a very high spatial and uh, chemical resolution. Um, we also have a, a very wide range of uh, bulk analysis uh, capabilities. I won't go into that. Um, we're, we don't have too much in that area there in the middle, we, but we keep an eye on that. Um, <coughs> and see, uh, similar to what George has explained, is that we're trying to sort of uh, solicit ideas and needs, um, but uh, so far that has not been an area where we had uh, much uh, activity. 20% um, of the usage of our capabilities uh, is in the bulk, um, about 60 into this uh, service analysis and uh, microscopy, and the remaining 20% is in sample preparation and processing and coding and uh, heat treatment and all those kind of areas. Just give you uh, some metrics. We have about 700 users per year. They generate uh, $2 million of uh, revenue. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, nine managers seem to be able to spend much more than what we get in. So they spent $2.4 2 million, and that difference comes from the NSF as well as from uh, the university um, that uh, sponsors uh, our activity at about an equal range of $200,000 per year. Uh, so the total recovery rate is somewhere in the area of about 80% or somewhat higher. Uh, this shows you the uh, users. Um, as uh, I show, as I told you, uh, we are hosted by the Cornell Center for Materials Research, and 17% of our <coughs> revenue is basically created by the researchers that we fund. Um, you can see that about... Um, uh, 40, no, um, 75 percent of the usage comes from um, the, the CCMR, uh, arts and sciences, engineering, and other centers, which also have mainly their sort of um, uh, host, uh, hosted uh, by those uh, colleges. We get some usage, but it's growing from CALS and the College for Veterinary Medicine, and about 20 percent of the overall usage uh, comes from uh, external usage, um, and a, a major share of that is coming from uh, industry. This is uh, in, in all uh, dollar-wise, okay? Um, all users pay standard rates. We have academic rates and industrial rates. Um, standard rates for internal academic or external academic doesn't make any difference. Show you some more information about our electron and optical microscopy. Um, so we've got uh, a wide range of TEMs. Um, one I want to point out is the third one on that list, which is a um, which is called a, a Bayer twin. It's a specimen, uh, it's a uh, 120 kV electron microscope uh, with a high numerical aperture, which gives you a larger depth of field, which is uh, uh, very useful for biological applications. Um, 
SEMs, uh, a wide range, uh, very high resolution uh, field emission SEM. Uh, one SEM that I want to point out is the Cryo uh, field emission SEM that we inherited uh, from the former CIMC. Um, that's now fully operational, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, a dual beam FIB is maybe something that you've not have heard about before, and I'll show you an example of uh, what you can do with that, but you can basically uh, image with electrons as well as with ions, and you can etch and dig and uh, manipulate your samples. Um, let me just go uh, through uh, some of uh, the examples that I want to show you. This is a very traditional, classical, uh, low-resolution SEM. Uh, of a mosquito, and we gave this particular one a green uh, hearing um, um, organs uh, that uh, were part of the study. Uh, they don't normally come in that color, uh, but this is uh, an add-on that we can do for you if you want to. Um, so this is basically the ion beam. It's an instrument that has been here on campus for about uh, two years now. It comes out of the electron uh, electronics industry, um, what you can use to repair and uh, inspect uh, chips at a very high resolution. Um, so it's got a, a standard sort of electron gun that you can use as a scanning electron microscope, but it's also got an ion column uh, that you can use and it gives you very high contrast uh, images, which is uh, in, in many uh, life sciences applications uh, an advantage to uh, use that. But you cannot only um, use that for imaging, but you can also do that for etching and digging. Um, and you can use it for a deposition of metals there um, on a very, a very small scale. Uh, and that allows you to do, for instance, something like this. This is a very delicate sample uh, that we prepared for SEM using a, a focused ion beam. Um, the top uh, there, the gray area, that's a platinum uh, protection. Uh, so you can also do basically masking uh, of your sample, and then uh, the sample was cut with a, an ion beam, and there on the left you can see the, um, the manager, Mick Thomas, and the actual equipment, which is in Duffield Hall. Um, this is another example that I want to show you. Uh, this is a cell. Um, uh, on, the, on the left you see the cell intact, and on the right you see that we cut through it using a gallium ion beam. Uh, it's got these striations uh, that uh, normally biologists do not really like to see but it's not the equivalent of an optical microscopy. Uh, you do this basically to zoom in uh, on a particular part of your sample and then you can put it either in an SEM or you can put it into a TEM to do your uh, actual analysis. We're in the process of uh, um, um, adding X-ray capabilities on this uh, uh, dual beam FIB that allows you to do sort of elemental mapping if you're interested in uh, that sort of features. Uh, another uh, sample uh, example that I want to give you is of the cryo SEM that was uh, before here on uh, the campus with the uh, College for Veterinary Medicine. It's now in uh, Bard Hall. It's operational. Um, um, this is an example of um, an apple stem uh, using cryo SEM. The image is taken at the at the low temperature. Uh, some work that we're doing in collaboration with uh, Tyrion Bowerley from the Cal's uh, uh, College. Um, another instrument that we have that could be of interest to you is uh, Raman imaging and this is uh, uh, this gives you an example of a, um, a piece of bone of a rat um, where the um, uh, basically the the, the, um, the food was changed for the rat and we wanted to the, the, the investigator wanted to see what the actual impact was and here you can see um, the um, fluorescence uh, image, that local area is uh, blown up here, and then this little bit here is uh, uh, then uh, investigated with um, a Raman scanning, and it gives you uh, a ratio of uh, mineral to matrix and a um, indication of what the uh, calcium to phosphate uh, ratio is uh, for this particular material. Um, that uh, capability is uh, operational. We're also going to get a Fourier transfer uh, infrared uh, microscopy capability uh, also in that facility, and that's coming up within the next couple of months. So this is our website. I don't know if that's something you can link to Vivo, but um, for, uh, so basically we have, for each instrument we have, so there's 150 pages. We have the, the manager, uh, the, um, you can directly uh, uh, make the reservation. Here it goes into this uh, coral booking system. It's got a short description, some useful links, um, and the contact information of the uh, manager. So that's how we sort of um, try to uh, make the information about our capabilities um, available as much as possible. Um, that was the last slide. That's it. Okay. 
And if you have any questions, um, ccmr.cornell.edu, that's the website, and you can uh, find all the contact information there. More than five minutes, I'm sure. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, these are all marathons. Um, I, I just want to mention, I forgot to show my most important slide, which was my acknowledgement slide, uh, which acknowledges all the people um, uh, is, in, my, in my center. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, Life Sciences Core Laboratory Center is, uh, you know, I mentioned we do team uh, support of all the instruments. It's, uh, the, the whole center is really uh, just successful because we are a big team. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of the core directors in the audience. Uh, there's uh, a lot of staff uh, that uh, provide a lot of invaluable um, expertise and, and wonderful results. And there's a lot of faculty advisors that uh, really provide uh, uh, great input and uh, great um, uh, advice. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to hand this over to um, uh, Harry Lander. Uh, uh, the, uh, from the um, uh, Weill Cornell uh, Medical College uh, to uh, uh, give us an overview of the core resources on the uh, Cornell New York City campus. Thanks, George. Um, I just discovered about 15 minutes ago that I can provide slides, so, um, so I won't. However, um, I would like to, actually, Yuri's presentation was, was a good segue because although I'll quickly describe several of our core facilities, I'd like to focus on the ones that um, clearly there is no overlap with the Ithaca campus, particularly the ones uh, we have for imaging uh, humans and animals. Um, but in a, a quick overview, we have 23 core facilities at the medical college. Some of those include what I call um, some of the, those include the DNA sequencing facility, which of course is done at, at, at Ithaca. Um, but we also have um, in, some interesting ones I want to just highlight quickly. We have an NMR um, facility where we can do protein structure analysis and small molecule analysis. We have a synthetic chemistry core facility as well. Um, a flow cytometry core facility for analyzing um, cells in solution particularly um, expression of, of various antigens, uh, an electron microscopy facility. But what I do want to spend some time on, uh, just five or ten minutes, is on what I would call the Citigroup Biomedical Imaging Center, which is a large research uh, structure very close to our main medical school, just two blocks away. But uh, <clears throat> when we built it, rather than going up, we went down into the uh, solid bedrock because we have actually a, a cyclotron uh, in there, it's smaller than yours, but uh, a, a cyclotron nonetheless. One of only two in New York City. So um, this facility was designed to image humans and animals, and um, we have uh, two of the three, or what are called 3T, 3 Tesla MRI instruments. These are um, MRIs that if you go for um, some shoulder problem or elbow problem or knee problem and you go into one of those MRI machines, those are clinical MRIs. We have a, a research MRI, but they're effectively a clinical machine that have been souped up, so to speak. And these are uh, three Teslas, so they're twice the strength of more common clinical magnets. And we do a lot of brain imaging, both what's called functional MRI, so um, we can inject contrast and look at metabolism in the human brain as you are doing, for example, a cognitive task. We image um, for oncology as well. We do Alzheimer's disease research, but almost all neuroscience, um, certainly in the brain, we, we, we do. Um, we have many users of the uh, MRI portion of the facility, both um, at Walt Cornell from Rockefeller University, as well as um, external um, organizations as well. We recently um, received a high-end instrumentation grant and um, did some cost sharing. We now have a seven Tesla MRI, which is, um, you can't put a human in it or they would boil, but you can certainly put an animal in it. And um, we can now image mice and, um, and guinea pigs and small, small animals 
at a very high resolution. Again, the nice thing is you do not have to sacrifice these animals. You can image them sequentially um, over time so that you can see the development of um, or the effectiveness of some treatment. As you go down in our building, which I can't show you, um, we have a PET CT, which is a, uh, a PET camera coupled with an a, a X-ray CT, where you can get anatomical structure in humans or again in, in animals, uh, coupled with uh, trachea studies. So the PET camera uses uh, radioactive isotopes, very short-lived, many of which we create um, downstairs in our cyclotron. The PET camera typically, for people who, for example, have lung cancer, they are typically imaged in a PET camera clinically. They're given a radioactive glucose molecule injected with it, and the tumors, of course, are dividing more quickly than normal tissue, take up the glucose, and you can image those tumors in the uh, patient. So in addition to those types of studies, we also create other radionuclide um, tracers, including those that image um, Alzheimer's disease, um, ones that bind to uh, neuroendocrine tumors, that is, they bind some of the um, adrenergic receptors. And you can image very uh, carefully, again, with the CT information, exactly um, what's going on in the patient or in the animal. We also do uh, non-human primate studies there. Um, another piece of equipment we have there is a micro-pet, which is, again, a uh, it's similar to the 7T MRI. It's a smaller PET camera, um, but a much smaller bore, so you could a analyze at a higher resolution. Um, you can put animals in, uh, small animals or even a newborn um, human into that machine. And finally, in the basement of the building, or sub-basement, is our cyclotron and radiochemistry facility, where we produce all kinds of nuclides, um, some with half-lives of uh, two minutes, up to two hours, and um, we couple them to all different uh, types of, of compounds, and in some cases, we just create the radioactive tracer itself, for example, um, O15, octogen 15, which is immediately pumped up uh, direct to the patient waiting in the PET camera because of its very short half-life, and uh, you can image perfusion uh, like that. So that facility is a very expensive facility. It's if you can count the construction of the building, but as well as the equipment, it's about $50 million now. Um, it has a very large operating budget. We have many uh, physicists there, uh, nurses, technicians, um, staffing all of the equipment. And we run it just like any other core facility, uh, of course, because it's, it's human subject research or, or patient, you, you have to have, of course, the proper um, IRB and IAPOC uh, approvals. Um, so in, in a way, it's. I, w I just wanted to highlight that clinical um, core facility because um, it's a way of taking, going from the basic sciences, which of course the Cornell campus is very, the Ithaca campus is very strong on, and um, complementing that with our more clinically based activities down here in New York City. So short of, uh, since I don't have any pretty pictures to show you this year, um, but I promise I'll bring some next year, I'm going to pass it on to Kali. Thank you, Harry. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you well. If, if you okay, could I'm introduce to yourself. My screen. Yes, I'm Khalid Machaka. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here at the Qatar campus. And I'm going to try to project my screen. You guys see it okay? Yes. Yes. So, so clearly we're a much younger campus than either the Ithaca or the medical school campus. The research effort has been uh, started here about a year ago. Um, and what I thought I'd do initially, just to give people a feel about where we're at, is give you an overview about you know, what's on the ground now in terms of research in Qatar. And uh, I'll, then I'll switch and tell you a little bit about the course that are planned at the uh, whole country level in Qatar and also at um, uh, Wild Cornell and specific, specifically in, in Doha. So um, 
a little bit about uh, the campus here. So clearly we're a branch campus of the medical school in New York. Um, uh, teaching is done by both resident faculty in Doha or uh, wild faculty that come uh, for a week or so and uh, provide some of the material. It's a little different than the typical medical school curriculum in the U.S., which is a four-year uh, undergrad and then a four-year medical school, uh, where here we have a two-year pre-med and then a four-year medical school uh, curriculum that ends up with an MD degree from, um, from Cornell. Uh, the teaching facilities and the research facilities are cutting edge. Uh, we provide research experience to the students early on, and interactions with patients, as is the case in, in New York. So there's a five-year research program that's been uh, discussed for a long time in Doha and has very recently been funded, uh, so we're up and running. And the goals of, the, of this program over five years, so, so one of the main things we deal with in Doha is part of our mission, since we're fully funded by Qatar Foundation, is capacity building at the whole country level. Uh, you know, uh, Qatar is a wealthy country and they want to, uh, you know, uh, so to speak, put Qatar on the map in terms of biomedical research, but there's really nothing on the, at the ground, you know, I mean, until Cornell was established here, there was very little biomedical research at the whole country level. So when we're establishing these programs, we're really establishing them from scratch, where, uh, you know, you have to do everything from the procurement system to the compliance issues, so on and so forth. Uh, so very basic, simple things that, you know, you don't even think about in the, in the States, we have to build from scratch here. But the goal over five years is to develop a first-rate uh, basic translation and clinical research program in Qatar. Uh, bio develop biomedical research infrastructure, and that we've already done a lot of. So we have labs up and running, I'll tell you some more about that. We have four facilities that are up and running. Uh, vivarium is in the planning stages. Uh, most of our compliance issues have been dealt with um, uh, and you know we're, we're developing uh, gradually. Uh, we want to develop, I mean part of the biggest uh, challenges here is develop a critical mass of researchers because there are just so few people doing research in the country or even regionally for that matter. And then we also would like to use the strength of the existing uh, institutions here um, and um, really use the special uh, population in terms of clinical research, given the consanguinity in Qatar, um, you know, you can use that effectively for a lot of um, gene mapping type of studies, especially for complex diseases. And there's a lot of involvement from uh, investigators uh, in New York uh, to use that population for uh, very specific studies, including diabetes and so on. And eventually, the ultimate goal is to take the, the you know, um, uh, findings that uh, come from the clinical or basic research and commercialize them through QSTP, which is the Qatar Science and Technology Park, which is kind of like a, a, an incubator, a biotech incubator for promising technologies to um, uh, turn them into commercial ventures at the whole country level. So what's on the ground now in, in Doha? So there are um, now nine um, labs that are functional. And these span interests from the molecular to the translational epidemiological areas. Um, we've been successful, we've been quite successful at recruiting postdocs and technical staff um, locally and internationally. Um, you know, um, after a year of beating our head against the wall, finally we have a procurement system where we can get stuff and actually do research. Uh, like I said before, the compliance issues are um, up and running. We have an IRB, our IACOG goes through New York for now, and we have an IBC uh, uh, also up and running. The two cores that I'll talk a lot more about are the genomics and imaging core that are up and running, and I'll tell you about the plant cores, the plant cores that are we're also planning. Um, you know, and we very recently had papers accepted from the research effort in Doha, so you know we are up and running. And extramural funding has been quite good through the Qatar National Research Fund. So you know, again, the research program is it's in, in, in its infancy, but I believe we're on the right track. Um, very quickly, the, uh, the, in addition to the core facilities planned at Cornell in Doha, um, uh, 
there are multiple additional facilities planned at um, other institutions in Doha, Sidra uh, primarily. And I list them here very briefly. There's a chemistry uh, uh, facility planned at Sidra, uh, an imaging facility which overlaps with a lot of what Harry talked about in terms of the cyclotron, PET imaging, micro PET, so on and so forth. Proteomics facility, which we're, um, we're beginning to plan um, at Cornell. Viveria, obviously, um, biomedical informatics, computational biology and biostatistics, genomics, which is fully up and running. Gene therapy will also be at Sidra. And stem cell, which we have a lot working on stem cells now um, on our campus here. So um, what do we have in terms of core facilities um, at Cornell now in Doha? Probably the, the largest and most successful one is the genomics core, uh, directed by Joel Malik, who unfortunately couldn't, couldn't be here, he's traveling, uh, to promote um, probably the highlight of the um, genomics core facility that uh, today, where Joel and his team uh, have been able to sequence the date palm genome, de novo, using sec uh, next generation sequencing. Um, and. Uh, you know, that's, that's been quite exciting. So uh, what, what these guys do in the lab is they use, um, you know, uh, they try to develop, de push the next generation sequencing technology toward de novo sequencing. Uh, they do copy number variation, gene annotation type of studies. That's what we've done on, the, on their de novo sequence from the Dave Paul genome. Um, they're doing sequence capture type of experiments for investigators in New York, actually and chip sequencing experiments also. Um, FMetrics, uh, a lot of gene expression studies for investigators both in New York and in Doha, and chip-on-chip -chip experiments to map promoter regions in, uh, from mouse arrays. Um, you know, and then uh, they have the ABI robot um, that helped them set up a very large screening for SNPs and, and, and so on and so forth. They have the capabilities to do um, high throughput extractions of DNA RNA from the Kai Symphony, and then routine sequencing that we're using heavily, most of the investigators here use heavily also, and then the basic equipment. And uh, the LIMS is in its final stages of implementation, and the goal is to use the LIMS to follow uh, individual clinical samples using the barcoding uh, system. So uh, in the future, the goals of the, so, so since this is such a small core, and uh, the goal is to try to focus on uh, technologies that we can help investigators develop them. And we believe that's the strength of the core. So what Joel would like to focus on are the three technologies of next-gen sequencing, microarrays, and genotyping. Um, and he would like to um, basically other technologies that uh, we don't have the capacities to undertake here, source them out to other uh, labs, either at Ithaca or um, other institutions. And uh, you know, his, uh, you know, basically, I think the strength of the core here is really pushing the next gen generation technology to do, um, uh, you know, cutting edge um, findings at this point. Uh, very briefly, uh, the imaging core, um, we have the typical stuff where you have plate readers, so on and so forth, uh, an LSM 710 confocal, a delta vision system uh, that does deconvolution, ratiometric imaging system, and the BD fax area with six lasers that can do uh, cell sorting and multi color analysis. That's heavily used now to pull up uh, for stem cell research, to pull up uh, stem cell populations from different tissues. Uh, the plant cores, uh, very uh, soon hopefully you'll see ads in Science and Nature where we'll be recruiting for bioinformatics and proteomics course directors. And uh, you know, once those people are underground, hopefully they can develop these cores. Um, so I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Seth. <clears throat> so, um, uh, first, I'd uh, like to thank all the speakers. Um, this was not a this this was uh, presented something of a logistical problem to pull together all these people together at the same time across all these time zones, and I, I really appreciate the effort of everybody involved. 
Um, so um, uh, we have time for one or two questions, if, uh, if people like. Um, uh, and if you uh, don't have questions now, we will be having our um, poster um, uh, expo uh, starting at noon uh, in the biotech building in the first floor in the large auditorium, uh, G10. That will go from uh, noon to 3. Um, we, we have core directors from uh, both the uh, uh, Weill um, Cornell Medical College from New York City have come up here, and there are a, l a large number of life sciences core directors on the Ith Ithaca campus who will be presenting posters about their core resources and services, and there will be an opportunity for um, everyone to just talk to them directly about uh, what's available, uh, what they could do to support uh, investigator uh, research projects. So, um, but while we have the rare opportunity of uh, having um, uh, both uh, Dr. Robert Berman, uh, Dr. Harry Lander, and Dr. Ka Khalid Makahaha, um, uh, uh, all uh, at the same time. I'd uh, like to just open it up to uh, any questions that folks might have. Uh, hi, this is James Vinny uh, from uh, Cornell Ithaca. Uh, for Khalid, I was wondering on your limbs, did you, uh, are, did you do in-house development for that, or did you uh, contract that out? <clears throat> so uh, we're waiting for the bits now. I think we're leaning more toward the genealogics uh, because they have um, uh, solutions, out-of-the-box solutions for anything from uh, genomics type of analyses to your billing to uh, clinical types of uh, uh, research and so on. So no, we won't develop it in-house. It will be commercial. And uh, because, you know, part of the issues we deal with is we want to be up and running quickly. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a small enterprise. So um, we find that at least for us at this stage of our development, out of the box solutions work best at this point. Thanks. So um, I, I was really interested in the de novo assembly of a large scale plant genome uh, using a short read sequencing. Uh, we'll definitely be following up with Joel about uh, the techniques that he used to do that. I think that could be uh, extremely interesting and useful to quite a few investigative groups uh, uh, down on the Ithaca campus. Right. Just, just to highlight that a little bit, I mean, to me it was just flabbergasting. You know, they started the sequencing of the date palm, and they were done collecting raw data in about eight weeks, which is, which is shocking, you know. I remember the days when I used to be in the lab running sequencing gels and then reading them. And now in eight weeks, you know, he can pull off the sequencing of the whole date palm genome. The analysis end was the bottleneck, realistically. And, um, you know, um, although the paper has been submitted now and so on, but I think, you know, much more sophisticated analyses can be done on those types of uh, raw data. And that's, that's where the bottleneck is now. Um, so, I, again, I'd like to thank all the speakers, and I'd like to invite everybody who's uh, on the Ithaca campus to come and have uh, some uh, good food and uh, hopefully some good conversation with all the core directors. And we'll certainly report to the Weill campus and the Cutter campus how good the food is. Thank you. <laughs>